Services School. And we're honored uh, to be working with E4J, uh, Evangelicals for Justice, uh, for this conversation over the next couple of days. Uh, this is an event uh, that was no cost and we welcome your uh, participation in uh, helping fund and donate to either of these organizations. You'll see links uh, coming to you either in the chat or, or in your emails and we welcome your participation that way. Uh, I want to turn this over now to Lenore. Hello, welcome everybody. <clears throat> Evangelicals for Justice is a network of evangelicals dedicated to making a broad impact through prophetic witness to the church. We are justice-centered and also affirm that we have political and theological differences. We hope to create a space where we can learn from each other even if we disagree. <clears throat> After each session today, there will be a link where you can join a smaller discussion. Um, There'll be groups to interact and discuss the ideas that you're hearing the conference today. So uh, the link will show up in the chat. In addition, if you'd like to be a member on the listserv, then please fill out um, that link in the chat. I am going to go right ahead and introduce our speakers today in the order that they will appear. Dr. Sung Chan Ra is a prolific author, and my recent favorite is, of course, Unsettling Truths, right behind him. <laughs> it's about the doctrine of discovery, so important. He is an ordained pastor and the Milton B. Ingebrigtsen Professor of Church Growth and Evangelism at North Park University, transitioning uh, uh, into his appointment as the next Robert Munger Professor of Evangelism at Fuller Theological Seminary. Then we have Dr. Ange Marie Alfaro. She is an author and her fourth book being American Political Thought, African American Political Thought, Contestation and Change. She is a recognized scholar of intersectionality as a framework to analyze and resolve social justice issues. And she refers to herself as a woman of faith and a lifelong justice junkie. Then we'll have Dr. Chow Romero, he is a UCLA associate, professor, historian, pastor, lawyer, and author. His books include The Brown Church, Five Centuries of Latina Latino Social Justice, Theology and Identity. And Dr. Russell Jung will finish. Um, he is a professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University. He is a sociologist of race and religion and the author of At Home in Exile, Finding Jesus Among My Ancestors and Refugee Neighbors. So welcome everybody. Each speaker will speak around eight or nine minutes and Andy will be the timekeeper. So you don't have to worry about that. And afterwards we will have question and answers um, to the speakers, although you will not have the capability to, to put questions in the chat. And at the end, um, we will have discussion groups if you would like, and that will be announced um, and you will go to a separate link for that. So then we'll come back at, at 3.35 for the next session. So Dr. Ra. Thank you, Lenore. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, very excited for a conversation today. Um, Given the big topic, I thought it might be worthwhile to talk about um, uh, maybe how we got here in terms of the evangelical identity and how it became so connected to Trumpism and to white nationalism. Um, so obviously this is not a uniformed story. This is not just kind of one thing that happened and all of a sudden uh, we have where we are right now. There are multiple layers and uh, these threads that are interlinked. So. What I wanna give is a description and I wanna put a caveat up front that this is mostly uh, white evangelicalism and this narrative of white evangelicalism that we've seen, especially in the last 40, 50 years and how these threads of evangelicalism have led to where we are right now. So um, I'm gonna argue that there are, and these are kind of very sweeping broad 
uh, framework. So uh, to, to understand that, that I'm gonna say that there are four to five major threads of current expressions of evangelicalism. And uh, the first, and I'll, uh, if you see the slide here, you'll see the, uh, the appropriate text if you wanted to follow up on these particular threads of evangelicalism. Uh, the first would be the fundamentalist thread and the second would be the reform thread. Um, I put five in parentheses because Pentecostal charismatic thread can actually find itself in multiple spaces and I'll explain that in just a minute. There is the neo-evangelical thread and then finally there's the progressive evangelical thread. So the four major ones that I wanna focus on is fundamentalism, reform, neo-evangelical and progressive. Um, fundamentalism in terms of its political orientation for as many of us would recognize tends to fall towards the political conservative side of the equation. And they would be, you know, the, the, the Franklin Grahams of the world and the Jerry Falwell Juniors of the world. Uh, and uh, fundamentalism emerges in the early part of the 20th century as kind of a, an anti-establishment, an anti-modernist um, uh, type of movement. And you see their kind of uh, history throughout the last hundred years or so. Uh, there is a strong separatist thread at least in the early stages of fundamentalism, but that changes is, again, according to George, uh, Joel Carpenter, that actually shifts over in the 50s and 60s. Uh, the other thread is the reform thread, and that comes out of our uh, early history around the reformed uh, Presbyterian, uh, the Edwards, Jonathan Edwards, the Cotton Mathers, uh, oftentimes centered in places like New England. Uh, that thread has kind of maintained and find its expression into the 21st century as well. One thing I'll note, Mark Noll does a really good job of explaining the reform thread. But if you wanna know how Southern Baptists became part of the reform thread, oftentimes you see them associated with fundamentalism, but they're actually nowadays more uh, associated with the reform thread. Greg Willis's book is actually an excellent description of that. Uh, the Pentecostal charismatic is problematic because you will find most Pentecostals, kind of the old school Pentecostals land in more of the fundamentalist th stream and many of the charismatic actually land more in the neo-evangelical th stream. Now, I'm not talking about their theology. Pentecostal theology and fundamentalist theology are very distinct and different, but politically, many of the Pentecostals end up in the same camp as the fundamentalist, and many of the charismatics end up in roughly the same camp as the neo-evangelicals. So with the neo-evangelical thread, here we're looking outside of the fundamentalist reform thread. Uh, Donald Dayton does a really good job of describing the pietists, the holiness movement, um, other kind of movements outside of the fundamentalist reform that become part of the neo-evangelical thread. And then finally, there's the progressive thread, which you see emerging in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, Kibido writes about the young evangelicals and David Schwartz writes about the moral minority. Uh, this is to point out that, that evangelicalism is not monolithic, and most of us know that, but that these multiple threads actually were kind of brought together to form this larger movement around evangelicalism post-1960s and 1970s. And what we'll notice here is that these uh, commonalities between these threads is not so much theology or ecclesiology. Uh, the theology of a fundamentalist Christian and the theology of a Pentecostal charismatic are very noticeably, notably different. However, they end up oftentimes in the same sociological uh, political space. And uh, so the, it's not so much theology that seems to unite evangelicals. Now, there's a number of works that say it's like high Christology, high Biblicism, uh, the belief in kind of an active salvific faith, uh, uh, the, you know, that there are kind of four or five different characteristics that unite evangelicalism that can be argued for. But what I'm gonna say is that even if that were true in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even into the 90s, over the last 15, 20 years, the definition of evangelicalism has moved away from a theological ecclesial definition to a much more social political definition. And I'll just give you a, an anecdote on this. Uh, several years ago, I got a phone call from the Wall Street Journal and they wanted to do an article about evangelicalism. And um, you know, after the, the brief interview, they, I asked the reporter, like, how did you get into this? How did you get into the work of reporting on uh, in the Wall Street Journal in a, as an evangelical on evangelicalism? I asked, are you an evangelical? No, I, I'm Jewish. I said, well, how did you get into this field? And he said, well, my background is political science. That was my major as an undergrad. And that was what actually made her um, 
uh, capable of reporting on evangelicalism. So even the Wall Street Journal would say evangelical is identified more as a political movement because our reporter is not theologically evangelical, doesn't really know that world through that lens, but sees the evangelical world through a political lens. And that actually became more of what defines evangelicalism. So we've seen that over the last 10, 20 years, the defining of evangelicalism, not through theology, ecclesiology, but more through a social political lens, sociological, oftentimes meaning white, uh, political, oftentimes meaning Republican. Uh, so we begin to see this in a lot of different ways throughout evangelicalism, where there are certain sociological characteristics. Uh, and again, there's kind of works on this, uh, this kind of hyper rationality or the belief in one's own capacity to reason. Molly Worthen's book is excellent on this. Uh, so there's kind of this self-perception that evangelicals are reasonable, rational, thoughtful people, educated people. Uh, and of course, the most recent book on one of the more recent books on this, uh, Dumez's book on masculinity, that masculinity becomes a characteristic of evangelicalism. Uh, we know that individualism is a hyper, hyper individual is a characteristic of evangelicalism, materialism and conservatism. So these kind of three, four characteristics are indicative of a sociological definition of evangelicalism. Again, white, middle class in all probability, hyper masculine, hyper individual, materialistic, consumeristic, oftentimes suburban, and then again shifts to a political definition of political conservatism as characteristic of evangelicalism. Uh, and then of course, in more recent years, we've seen the connection of racism, white supremacy, and Christian nationalism as characteristics of evangelicalism. So what I wanna point out here is that a movement that you could make an argument early on, whether you agree with it or not, started off as a more theological ecclesial movement became a much more sociological movement, and now has become much more identified as a political movement. And a lot of the social politics that go with evangelicalism now is hyper political conservatism, racism, white supremacy, and American Christian nationalism. Um, I don't know if I have a clear explanation of this to say how this happened. We just know that this is what happened that if you trace the more recent history of evangelical Christianity, you see this kind of uh, uh, metamorphosis from a theological, ecclesial, spiritual movement to a much more sociological movement to now what is much more identified, certainly by the media, but maybe even amongst themselves as a political movement uh, and the tying of a certain type of political politics, usually conservative, uh, white nationalism even, to an evangelical Christianity. So one of the questions to ask is, well, where do we go from here? Is it possible to actually redeem that type of Christianity? Um, well, you know, part of it is what I wrote about very early on now coming up on 12 years uh, is that there could be a next evangelicalism that is less centered on white middle-class Republican values and more centered on the diversity of Christianity that is both global and uh, in the United States. Um, that could be one pathway out of, for example, white American nationalism by demonstrating an evangelicalism that is much more diverse and uh, 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 shows a different sociology compared to the assumptions around evangelical sociology. Um, but sadly, I think over the last four plus years, um, there's been a cementing of that I I um, identity and that narrative uh, and that's the question, has it cemented and, and, and become so ingrained and embedded into American evangelicalism now, is there a way out of it? Uh, that movement from theological ecclesial to sociological to now just almost exclusively political, uh, has that identity been so deeply cemented that there's really not much more we can do to move out of that entrenched identity around evangelicalism? So that's my hopeful comments for today. I'm glad I brought a smile to your face with all this positive enthusiasm and positive comments. I'll toss it back over to the next person. I think it's Anne Marie. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ra. And, and thank you um, to the organizers for inviting me. Um, as I was telling the panelists before we started, I just feel really honored to be in this space. Um, I am a political theorist and, and not a theologian, not um, a, a scholar of you know, um, 
our faith, uh, but I am somebody who has tracked um, the ways in which Trumpism has really um, emerged over the past few years. Um, and of course, I'm a citizen living here as well. Um, so I want to talk um, today about four kind of ways that I think Trumpism has really had a negative influence on our faith. Um, I want to frame it as Trumpism is really um, two things at the same time. Um, it is both a symptom of and an outcome of a movement backlash that has occurred periodically over the course of our country's history. Um, I want to focus today on the ways in which the hijacking of evangelicalism has occurred um, as a backlash against racial change um, and progress on gender, um, and that those two threads drive the political activism that we see. Um, so, so as you just heard Dr. Ra talk about, um, more recently this has come up again in terms of the overt and um, explicit embrace of things like white supremacy and racism. Um, but I want to contend that that's actually happened multiple times in our past as well. Um, and so now politics, you know, has always produced strange bedfellows. Um, but I would argue that this kind of association between Trumpism and uh, white uh, Christian nationalism um, is, is not strange at all. Um, biblical explanations for slavery um, emerged after black and white abolitionists pointed out the biblical foundations um, that cut against chattel slavery in the 18th century at the founding of our nation. Um, so, so even then, even as early as the 1780s in our country, the biblical justifications that become the foundation of a white supremacist Christian nationalism in 2021 are responding to evangelical activists, Christian activists, to use the proper term, um, who were actually saying, no, in fact, slavery as it's practiced in the United States is non-biblical, it is not biblical. Um, and so I wanna just kind of point that out for two reasons. One, I think it's really important for us to know the history, but the other reason I think it's really important for us today is as we think about what 2021 and beyond will look like, we do want to think about and embrace and stand in our own power, our own ability, to actually connect the dots and to say, not only has this happened before, but we also need to know that we are not shrinking violence. We can absolutely stand for change. We can absolutely stand and take back um, some of the ways in which uh, this has gone off in this same direction over and over again. I think of it like a, you know, a tire in a well-grooved kind of pathway in a driveway, right? Um, so that we keep going off into this same hijacking. And so the challenge for us is not whether or not we have the power. It's not even whether or not we have, you know, the, the uh, inspiration to do it. We certainly know what we want to do. The challenge is how do we continue to keep ourselves right between the guardrails so that we don't veer off again, so that we don't see another January 6th, right, anytime in the next four years or beyond. Um, so I would say that the first way that um, Trumpism has kind of damaged um, uh, what we think of or affected our church, um, I would say it damaged. Um, I think it damaged our witness, um, certainly not the people on this panel, um, but if you think about, again, what we're called to do, and, and there are far more experts on theology than me on this panel, but what I do want to say is that to the degree we are called to be that light in the world, right, to show and attract people to Christ. One of my favorite Christian writers, Madeline Lengel, talks about we are to be, you know, show people a light so bright that they want to know more about it. I think our witness has really been damaged by those who embrace Trumpism at all costs. Um, and the fact that they are willing to do that in that strange bedfellows case. So even if they are not personally advocating white supremacy or personally advocating, they're willing to overlook Right, they're willing to overlook and excuse in a host of different ways all of the terrible things about gender and relationships between men and women that you know kind of not just emerged during uh, the Trump era, but again were part of the very constituency of who he is. Right, um, and so I think those willingnesses to overlook really damage our witness, especially as we try and stand and say that we are 
the people of the Bible. We are the people who are supposed to follow that book and that is supposed to be telling us, you know, how to actually follow Jesus. Um, and so, you know, every time I would hear someone say, you know, I don't agree with him on racism, sexism, whatever it is, but, you know, the other side, like that's one way in which, again, our witness has been really damaged, I think, um, by Trumpism and the embrace by many, many white evangelicals. And, and if we're being honest, you know, evangelicals of color too, who get caught up and swept up in some of that, um, you know, so I think that's a really big damage that we have. Um, the second, second kind of damage um, is it's really narrowed and limited our ability to unite as Christians of good conscience. Um, so I think about in 2017, when the, um, the family separations and the Muslim bans and other things were first being put into place, right? And you had conservative and liberal Christians who would come together, you know, and put that, that huge list of folks who signed that ad in the New York Times saying, you know, President Trump, don't do this. Don't do this in terms of restricting immigration, right? So, you know, you had conservatives and liberals on that list. And now the idea that there would be conservatives and liberal Christians on the same list pushing for any sort of policies seems almost impossible to even imagine. Um, because again, one of the things that Trumpism has done is tear us apart and un made us unable to have conversations across, again, good kinds of conscious decisions that we might disagree about, right? So we might not agree on how exactly we wanna make sure we are welcoming the stranger and we are welcoming the refugee, right? Some people may want people to learn English. Some people may not want people to learn English among the vast diversity of Christians. But now we can't even talk about that because we've got folks who want to just, you know, completely destroy the foundation of our faith, which is love your neighbor as yourself, right? One of the two great commandments. Um, the third way I think that Trumpism has damaged um, our country and each other and the church more specifically is that it's also damaged just by extension, our ability to trust and care for each other. Um, I think, you know, we've gotten into such a polarized situation and we've gotten into such a highly um, abusive situation uh, that we really don't have the ability to trust each other enough to have hard conversations without screaming, without cancels, without all of these different ways in which, you know, again, there were times and opportunities in the past where folks could try and find common ground. I think we don't trust each other and there's a demonization going on, frankly, um, you know, that is driven in part by social media, but I think is there, even if you're not on social media, you will hear this in the pulpits on Sunday in certain areas, right? Um, you will hear this repeatedly as a drumbeat. And I think that's a real, real challenge for the church um, because again, we are called to expand the church right? Not divide the church, not to make the church, you know, even more atomized than it already is in such a large and vast world. Um, and then I think the, the last thing, um, from my perspective, that's the most disturbing thing um, about uh, what's happened with regard to Trumpism um, and its impact on the church is the, the war on truth and knowledge. Um, the idea, again, that, you know, we as a people, we as people of faith who are Christians, you know, are called to welcome everyone. I was literally just listening to a sermon this morning reminding us, right, from the book of Acts, right, you see these calls where we are not to be racist, we are not to be sexist, right, we are all part of one body. Um, the church at Antioch is another good example, you know, um, but again, thinking about the ways in which that truth is no longer considered truth, right? It's not just the thou shalt not lie that gets violated. It's the very idea that there could be truth, which is, which is really mind blowing to me because again, you know, if we think about where evangelicals were in 2016 or in 2008, or, you know, even before that, the idea was at least that there was a truth and that people could actually know that truth. And to have Christians standing and saying, well, alternative facts are actually allowable, right? Or to have Christians standing and saying that there are ways in which, you know, we're going to overlook these inconvenient truths, 
about what's being done to real people in the world on a routine basis because of a myopic focus on policies that don't even work for the very issues that they want to move the needle on. Um, so whether it's reproductive rights or whether it's homosexuality or other things, the policies don't even work. That they, they ignore their own truth. They ignore their own knowledge. Um, those kinds of things, I think, are really, really going to be much more challenging for us to think about um, how do you kind of unring that bell? Um, how do you draw people in when, again, you know, we are supposed to be people who believe that there is a truth, and yet we were willing, you know, um, or white evangelicals and the folks who actually believe in Christian nationalism were willing to actually say, well, you know, truth and alternative facts, you know, we have to actually push back. Like, and that to me, both as a scholar, but also as, you know, as a Christian is, is probably, I think, the most damaging piece of uh, Trumpism's impact on the church. Um, so I'm gonna pause there, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to the next person. Um, I believe that is Robert, am, am I right about that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hancock Alfaro and Dr. Ra. Learn so much, I'm busy here taking so many notes. Um, in my, my comments, I'm going to focus upon um, the impact of Trumpism in the Latino, Latina evangelical church or evangelical church. And, it, and the Latino evangelical church has its own genealogy in Latin America and in the United States. It sort of, it uh, transverses those five threads that Dr. Ra mentioned, but has come to a head really in white Christian nationalism. I was reading Haggai this week, and this verse here really struck me. It says, I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the desirable and precious things of all nations. I will fill this house with glory and splendor. The shaking. The, the Latino Evangelical Church has been shaken over the last four years, and it's, it's been shaken, and it's a good thing because this shaking is sifting out 500 years of our own white nationalism in Latin America. As Latin America, those of us from Latin American descent, sadly, we invented white Christian nationalism 100 years before the pilgrims ever came and did all their thing, right? We had this colonial caste system that put Spaniards on the top as a social category, as a political construct, as a social construct, indigenous people at the bottom, those of African descent at the bottom, and those of mixed background all in the middle. We even drew these horrible paintings about that, right? Um, but we invented this, this, this whiteness category. We had our own caste system. And when our families come from Latin America to the United States, it's one easy hop, skip, and a jump from that legacy to Trumpism. It's a very easy hop, skip, and a jump. And for that reason, you know, um, Trumpism, it sort of was easy for a good number of Latino evangelicals to make that jump in the last four years. In the last election, I'm not going to dwell on this because I know there will, there will be other uh, panels that will focus on this, but, you know, we turned out in really large numbers, big increase from the last time. Overall, Biden won about the same uh, majority that Obama did um, in years before. But in Texas and in Florida, you had these sizable numbers of Latinos and Latinas that supported Trump. And according to Professor Gaston Espinosa from Claremont McKenna, it was Latino evangelicals who largely made that happen that grew the Trump base. And I would submit um, to you that a large part of that is the race issue that, that Dr. Ra mentioned, right? Tapping into this sort of sense of white nationalism and white superiority. And there are many, many Latinos, including my family members who I love dearly from places like, like Texas who would say, oh yeah, I'm white. And I don't like those, all those indigenous and, and Afro-Latino migrants from South America that are coming up the border. That's not me. Um, 
and I think many people say that because it threatens their American dream. It threatens their assimilation into whiteness, right? And that's perhaps confusing for people, but it's a reality that we can discuss more later. The fallout has been that thousands of young adult Latinas and Latinos are fleeing both the Latino evangelical church and the white evangelical church. Um, so num some numbers I've heard is that 1.2 million young adults of all stripes are leaving the church each year. And the same is true with Latina evangelicos. <coughs> um, I got this note from one of my students last, last spring. It was a class about the Brown church. And he said, as a Latino growing up as the son of an undocumented pastor, my experience was much different from those who surrounded me. I felt that I could not identify with my peers and I always felt out of place. My white peers accepted me in the way that I stood in right by being part of their denomination, but I was not accepted because of my skin color, my race or my father's undocumented status. I wanted to believe in what my family and church taught me as truth, but I slowly drifted away from my beliefs as a result of the testimony I received from the Anglo church and their members. And he probably could have added from the Latino evangelical church and many of its members as well. This is as someone who came to know Jesus as an adult and my life transformed, nothing breaks my heart more than seeing this, this exodus from the church. The hopeful thing though, is that I'm also experiencing as a community organizer, a new intergenerational movement bubbling. That's tapping into another 500 year legacy, but a 500 year legacy of the Brown church, 500 year legacy of a prophetic ecclesial community of Latinas and Latinos that has contested racial and social injustice in Latin America and the US. So in Latin America, side by side with the church of the status quo and of racial colonization, there's been this Brown church that for 500 years has contested those, that, that injustice. And many of us are coming to learn about that history and beginning movements around it. Um, this new movement, inter intergenerational movement, it's comprised of different organizations and leaders who have been doing the work already for many decades. There's some folks who are new to social justice, but once Trump started putting kids in cages and did these horrible things, many people from conservative denominations stepped up and said, that's too far. And you have a, develop a developing movement of young adults. Um, briefly, to um, to, for, uh, maybe it was about three years ago, and Pastor Noe Carillas, who was an Assemblies of God professor, professor, sorry, <laughs> my mind is in school, a pastor, he was threatened with deportation. And many people from conservative, conservative Latino evangelical orgs and denominations stepped up. And here's some pictures of that, right? It's part of the new movement. You have a young adult movement, young leaders, for example, that I'm connected to on Facebook, gathering weekly to think of dream of new ways of being church. In theological education, IET, or the Association for Hispanic Theological Education, it's been around for probably actually 25 years already, been doing the work. And, but again, just an example of the way in which people are continuing to, to separate Trumpism and, and this racist colonial legacy from the Latino church. If you've had amazing Latino community development orgs that have been doing this for decades as well, like Esperanza in Philadelphia, the Latino Pastoral Action Center in New York City. Again, people that have already been doing, doing this for decades and you're getting this coming together slowly, this bubbling of a movement, the Matthew 25 movement that I'm a part of, um, creating new models of ministry that are bringing immigrant churches together with white churches, with second, third generation Latinos in, in conjunction to stand for immigrant rights, right? Matthew 25. And folks like my, my good friend, um, Sandra Maria Van Opstel, right? Latina, who has launched this organization called Chasing Justice that goes beyond the Latino community and seeks to create multicultural movements and so this part is hopeful. And so again, there's a shaking that's happening, I think, shaking of the Latino church and it's shaking out all that legacy, 500 year legacy of, of, of Latin American colonialism.
and it's allowing new fruit to fall to the ground and to be born. Amen. I'll pass it on to, to my hero, Dr. Jung. Thank you, Dr. Romero. And um, hi, everyone. I'm Professor Russell Jung from San Francisco State. Um, you are expecting Dr. Andrea Smith, and unfortunately, she's not feeling well today. And um, so I hope we could all lift up our prayers for Andy. She's the main architect behind this entire conference. She's put in a lot of the legwork, the heavy lifting. So um, please thank Andy for all her work and just leading E4J um, all these years. Also, you know, she would have um, taken a different position. She would have added a lot of diversity to this panel, but I'm just another Asian male. That's always like one and a half of us are Asian males already. And so um, I can't speak for Andy, but I do want to acknowledge that I'm on Ohlone land and that I want to acknowledge um, their presence, past, present, and emerging future that um, we are on stolen land. And as Christians, we need to make reparations for that. Um, I, I'm just going to act as a discussant since I'm a replacement and just sort of highlight some of the things that the previous speaker said to lead us into more discussion and for your discussions when you enter into the um, small groups. So Professor Ra talked about the sources of Trumpism and how evangelicalism is really <clears throat> a political um, category. And now, um, really what's moving a lot of people is necessarily white evangelicalism, but is really sociologists are recognizing is Christian nationalism. And I want to explain what Christian nationalism is. It's actually a better indicator of Trumpism, of support for Trump, a better indicator of um, racist attitudes. And so if you're a white evangelical but are more devout, you are less likely to be Christian nationalist. You're less likely to be racist. But if you're of any group, if you're a person of color but more Christian nationalist, you're more likely to be a Trump supporter. So like um, Hans Marie talked about, it's. Christian nationalism comes out of um, sexism and racism. It's a backlash against the movements of uh, women and people of color in the 60s. So Christian nationalism is the merger of white supremacy with evangelical conservative Christianity with a patriarchalism. So when you merge those two and wed or wed all three, it becomes a cultural vision of how America should be. It becomes a political ideology. And that's why Christian nationalism is more of a political movement than like a theological um, construct. Um, and so it's, again, it's conservative and backwards looking, taking, making America great again. And it's oriented towards basically the understanding that America is um, a white Christian nation and it should be as it used to be. They adapt very black and white thinking that to keep America pure and the constitutional uh, constitution safe, we need to return to the old ways. And so because they have that black and white thinking, because they have this racialized perspective of America's whiteness, a patriarchal understanding that women should have a certain space um, that's why I'm um, promoting um, um, pro-life attitudes. That's why they're so against Black Lives Matter. They're really against interracial. Um, they're against interracial marriage. If, if you're more inclined towards interracial marriage, you're more a Christian nationalist. That's why they want to keep people um, outside the laws and to um, detain people at the borders. And that's why they're most supportive of excluding new immigrants. They, they don't think there's anything racist or stigmatizing about that term. And so this whole notion of Christian nationalism really is a great concept that better explains people's than even white evangelicalism. And so here's the opportunity to redeem and rehabilitate the notion of evangelicalism is if we I, properly identify Christian nationalism as the primary driver and ideology of a lot of racism, of a lot of um, Trumpism, rather than eat white evangelicalism, it helps whites from becoming too defensive and feeling too white, too much white fragility. 
it rehabilitates evangelicalism because it's not necessarily the theology, it's the Christianity plus the white supremacy plus the patriarchy that creates a lot of the damage. Um, I agree with um, Anj Marie that um, Trumpism has had really terrible outcomes and the impacts like she talked about are primarily um, the polarization of the church. And I, what our people go to church more based on their politics than on their faith. Rather than their faith shaping their politics, people's politics now shape their, their church affiliation. And that I think is um, sad. Um, like we talked about, we can't talk across political ideologies anymore. We're all in our little silos. You know, and I think about the early church being Jesus bringing together Simon the zealot and Matthew the tax collector, totally opposite political spectrum, but he created a beloved community. And that was part of the witness of the early church is to be racially reconciled and racially just. And I think we need to really recover that the splitting of the church. And I know I'm complicit, and I know a lot of people who are E4J, Evangelicals for Justice people, we may be like that because we're siloed too, and we don't know how to reach across. Um, another damage is um, the church's witness overall. Um, just how sociologists know that um, evangelicals' complicity with Republicanism is a primary driver of church decline. So the primary reason why we have a higher um, number of religious nuns, why so many people are disaffiliating with the church, why there's a 17% overall drop in the church, a cent drop among Hispanics, and a 12% drop among Blacks. Um, it's all be mostly driven by the political marriage of um, whiteness and the Republican Party. So how do we, again, rehabilitate um, the church's disastrous marriage with republicanism? How do we um, have a, a moral reimagining of how America, my internet's bad, so if I cut off, I'm sorry. Um, what we need is a moral reimagining of our image of the United States and the church. And we need to reclaim that, otherwise, if we use a Christian national framework, it's a white Christian nation, that just excludes people of color, basically, it excludes uh, young people, it's, 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 it excludes, you know, 95% of the world, and so what kind of church is that? Mm. And I guess, um, finally, I think the impact on the church is like Dr. Romero concluded is that this is a real period of refinement and purification and shaking of us. And as we try to um, respond to Trumpism, who will be left in the church, who will consider themselves part of the church? Do we try to remain evangelical? Um, I think is a, a driving question for your discussion. groups, is it worth reclaiming those people, the church, in this time when the church's name and God's name has been trampled and um, really besmirched? So thanks. Okay, well, <clears throat> Since we don't have the capability for the audience to submit questions, um, but we'd still like to move into a time where we could moderate the questions to the speakers. So I'm gonna look at some, some basic questions. The first question is, um, how can the church respond to Trumpism's impacts? And, the, and I'm gonna give you a, ch a, a choice here. The second question is, what can we learn from Gen Z and millennials who are particularly disaffected from Trumpism in combating it and 
doing new forms of church. So I'm going to start with these two questions and you can choose any panelist, which one you want to answer. I'll jump in real fast with this. Um, from my experience with, with the young leaders, I'll just start with the story. I remember like I was giving, sharing with them about brown church and stuff and I was kind of getting too far into my like only prophetic hat. I remember they told me something, they said, hey profe, they said, um, have a little more patience with our parents <laughs> because they can't because because they came from civil war and and they they have carried so much generational trauma. I remember being like, "You are absolutely right." Thank you. That's good. Yeah, I, I'll just say in response to the first question about how can the church respond to Trumpism's impacts, um, mm -hmm. I'm actually going to I'm going to quote a, a new friend, um, Marlena Graves, um, who says that we need to repent. Right. I, th I think there is a serious call. Um, if anything, we've learned over the past four years or five years, um, I think it's that um, the centuries long failure to fully repent right, um, really came home to roost in the past mm -hmm. four years. Um, so, so the fact that we can't have a conversation about the impact of slavery, the fact that we can't have a conversation about, <clears throat> excuse me, the impact of harsh immigration laws or other kinds of things really has made it difficult um, for now there to be this space of a unified church. Um, and so, so I think, you know, I would say repentance is probably at the top of the list. Um, and um, and I'm, I'm really kind of moved by something that Russell, you said mm -hmm. just a few minutes ago about, you know, it, it is and it does feel easy for us to, you know, stay in our silos. Um, and, and again, you know, it, when you're just barraged with so much that we were barraged with over the past four years, I, I can understand that. Um, and I think, again, when we think about the, the repentance that, that Marlena has talked with me about, I would also add, um, we have to have the trust in God, right? Because he's the only way that we're going to be able to be strong enough to be in these situations where we can talk across these lines, right? And so I think, you know, the other piece of it is when it's scary and when it's sad and you feel like you can't go, that's the piece that we're going to have to hold on to is we're, you know, not going to be able to do it. It's absolutely true. You know, I'm not going to be able to talk to that person <laughs> in my family, right, who I have to eat meals with or who I have to, you know, see on holidays or whatever it is. Like, yes, and there's a God, there's a Holy Spirit, there's a Jesus. And that's what we have to hold on to to give us the strength to not let, right, the fear and the exhaustion kind of take over every single day. And it, it's hard. I, I, I want to say that I'm saying this and it is hard for me every day. So I'm not saying this as someone who is telling everybody what they should do. I'm saying I struggle with this myself. Yeah. I appreciate uh, it. Oh, Go. I'm sorry. I just wanted to add on to uh, Dr. Hancock's uh, comments because I always look for a chance to show my own books. Uh, but, you know, uh, in my work on lament, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the response, right? Because Trumpism is so wrapped up in this exceptionalism, triumphalism narrative of white American exceptionalism, white nationalism, triumphalism. And the biblical, you know, uh, response, appropriate response to a situation like that is the spiritual practice of lament. Um, I think the problem is that these narratives of exceptionalism and triumphalism is so deeply embedded that lament is, first of all, just the first step towards it. But I don't even think folks are willing to go there. Uh, this kind of inability to hear the stories of the slave trade, hear the stories of the Native American genocide, kind of closing their ears to it. Uh, but lament is the appropriate response when a community is caught up, either one in places of suffering <clears throat> or have caused that suffering to such an extent that they keep perpetuating that suffering. Um, you know, that's on my most optimistic days. If it would be great if the church responded with lament. Yeah, so I think I'll um, re affirm Dr. Ra's first call to lament and read his book on sale now at Amazon. 
But then the next step is what do we do when we lament and repent? How do we turn around, right? How do we get outside of this Christian nationalism? We need to decolonize our theology is one step that a lot of you could get involved with. This is what my church is. We're decolonizing and trying to figure out what parts of our faith are very white Christian, which parts of our faith are patriarchal, what do we need to repent of and turn away from? And then how do we turn to something better is the next step after turning away, what do we turn to? And part of it is reclaiming a lot of our indigenous um, practices, um, renewing and um, re-understanding other sources of tradition and truth and practice. And then the third step is really embodying it. And I think this is what I learned um, <clears throat> from younger generations is that they want a real authentic embodied faith. And so they wanna see their Christian lives and to see God move in real movements towards the issues that we're facing today, issues of racial injustice, racial issues of climate change, right? Racial issues of um, mass detention, mass incarceration, mass bans. And so the more we can embody our faith in concrete movements and to show people this is Jesus's love, um, I think is you know, much more evident way of the spirit's work in us than um, the old sort of pietistic models of faith. I think of Dr. James Cone when he was talking about, we can't, how do we get to conversations about hope when we can't even talk about lynchings? So I would like to, what do you think about how to bring those conversations out into the light? How do you talk about painful things? And this is where um, truth telling has gotten lost, right? So folks are denying Native American genocide, which I've heard over and over again. And these are not like, you know, random Joe in the pews. I've, I've talked to Christian history professors who've denied the genocide of natives. Uh, and, you know, even like the curriculum that is being formed that's saying, you know, slavery wasn't that bad. So there really is an absence of truth telling. And that goes back to a lot of what we've been saying is it really hurts our witness when Christians are supposed to be about the truth of the gospel and we can't even talk truth around history, truth around American, the American story. So, I mean, again, that this, this feels a little pessimistic, but that's where some of that truth telling needs to be, you know, has to kind of come forth. Um, and this is uh, something that I've been working on that um, you can change individuals and you can change systems and structures, but unless you change narratives, um, you're really not going to change the world. So we've talked about change individuals, lead them to Christ, very evangel evangelical approaches to salvation. Uh, and then there's others who have said, let's change the systems and structures. But at the end of the day, what is, and, and uh, Russell uses language, what is embedded in, and, and what is like, what has gotten into our worldview, our value system, what has gotten into our heart, soul, and minds? we're going to act reflexively out of that embedded narrative. And sadly, white supremacy, uh, American Christian nationalism, those are so deeply embedded. Our, people are responding to the different stories that are out there, the true stories that are out there around genocide, around slavery, out of what has been embedded. So, you know, we have to take responsibility for really, really bad discipleship in the evangelical church. And is it possible to confront that dysfunctional, horrid discipleship we've done with maybe a new form of discipleship that actually does embed truth now rather than, than lies. I think from like a, a Latino evangelical context, which is sort of related, but kind of different. I think that I've been surprised at the openness to truth telling about the history of Latin America that exists, like from like, more conservative, conservative denominations like Assemblies of God or something. When I frame it as, it, as we're losing our youth, our youth are leaving, that's like us enough of a jarring for many Latino pastors to be like, 
okay, let me let me take a listen to that. So just from the Latino context, I think approaching it that way, um, it's been surprising at the receptivity. So I, I just put something in the, the chat, but I'll just repeat it really quickly because I, I agree with um, what Dr. Rai, you were just saying. You know, I think a really important harm to our witness is until we acknowledge that truth, right? Like Russell, you were talking about doing in your church, until we acknowledge those harms, right? We're, we're actually denying God the opportunity to show off, right? We're, we're denying the opportunity to show to other people like, this is what God can do. Look at what God can do. God can bring together a civil rights movement, an abolition movement, an immigrant rights movement, you know, a, a movement for justice, uh, for, for the climate, good stewardship of the earth, you know, which we have been given. I mean, all kinds of ways that until you state, state the truth, you're actually denying God the opportunity to show off so that more people will be drawn to him. And so from my perspective, that truth moment is why it's so critical for that very reason, right? Because otherwise, then it looks like, well, this is the way it's always been. And why should we think anything different, you know? And so it's like, no, it's that brokenness that we have to show and we have to acknowledge to let him in. There's that wonderful, you know, the, the wound is where the light comes in kind of um, uh, saying that's very common and very meaningful. And I think Again, that's exactly what we lose when we allow ourselves to be driven off by alternative facts and lack of truth. Yeah, and I want to push the another step that we need um, truth telling and then we need the truth and reconciliation efforts like they did in South Africa. But then we need to move to the truth, reconciliation and reparation movement. And the call for African American reparations is, is valid and we need it on an institutional level, on the church level and on the American government level. I think Asian Americans have shown, you know, Japanese Americans were able to gain reparations um, for being uncon unconstitutionally incarcerated. And I think we could follow that same model to seek justice. And so again, that's embodied real justice that's concrete that we could mobilize around as a Christian act of what Jesus has done for us, basically. And so, um, it's not just truth telling, it's repentance and really moving towards God's kingdom rather than just, you know, I'm staying where we are at. Um, I'm gonna throw something out there that uh, it's not fully developed, but it's something that uh, Mark Charles and I had wrote about in, in, our, in our book. But the idea is that as we keep speaking truth, as all, you know, all four of us are saying, we've got to speak the truth. We've got to, you know, that's part of the gospel message to just speak the truth about our broken human condition. And that includes our history. Uh, and I think all of us are recognizing though, that it tends to hit a wall. It doesn't, we're not getting the response to that truth. Like, you know, in the, in the, in the scriptures, when Jesus speaks the truth, people respond to that truth with repentance, with lament, with, you know, the appropriate, sense of grief and, and, and you know, um, uh, repentance. Uh, but I think our frustration is that in the evangelical community, even after being confronted with the truth, there is an inability to respond in repentance. And that to me is one of those spaces where like, okay, at what point do I shake the dust off my feet and say, you know, they're not responding to the truth. The lament isn't there, the repentance isn't there. And so this is the idea that Mark and, and I were kind of working through in our book was, um, has white supremacy and has Christian nationalism actually benefited white people? And on one level, yes, they've got all the money, they've got all the power. Sure, on that level, white supremacy has benefited white people. But it has also traumatized a lot of white people. And, you know, this is controversial, but to say that our victimizers also traumatized by the broken false narratives that they are putting out there. I gotta say, Mr. Viking man, that man was traumatized. You look at his face, that's a traumatized man right there. When you saw that guy with his feet up on Pelosi's desk, I'm thinking, brother, you are traumatized. You've got some issues. And so at that point, I'm, maybe I'm a little more empathetic at that point to say, yeah, this person, they've got some issues here and their resistance to truth telling is much more spiritual than I realized. It's much more, sin-based and, and brokenness and justice, injustice-based 
And I, you know, I don't know if that, you know, it doesn't excuse their actions clearly, but you know, at some point I've got to figure out why is there so much resistance? And to some extent it's like, white Americans have been traumatized by white supremacy as victimizers, not as the victim. But you know, I, I honestly, I don't know where to go with that, but that's kind of the, that's the only measure of compassion I can, I can muster up to say white Americans have also been traumatized by the specter and demon of white supremacy. And that's the part where I can say, okay, then let's actually work through this together. That's a tough one. <laughs> okay. Hmm. We had a question here about what concrete steps can be taken with our evangelical institutions. Um, Lenore, it's time. We have to wrap up too. Oh, is it 310? Okay. Well, then we're going to move into <clears throat> um, our discussion groups. So if you would like to um, participate in that, then go to chat and find, oh, you can't find your, can they get, see the link? See the link to go to a discussion group and then come back at 3.30. Okay, yeah, the link is posted. Well, it's a separate link from this. So. That was so good. <laughs>